Hello students, welcome back to the course on organizational behavior, individual dynamics in organization. We move to the module 2 and this is the lecture number 2 of module 2. If you recollect in the previous lectures, especially in the module 1, we introduced you to the concept of what an organization is, how organization behavior, organizational behavior management has evolved. Organizational behavior as a discipline has taken contributions from significant contributions from different streams like anthropology, psychology, sociology, how it has emerged as a body of knowledge in itself. We have also looked into different perspectives of organizational behavior like uh, the systematic approach, the evidence-based management, the intuition, etc. We have also looked into what individual differences is and from that we progress to what exactly is diversity. So diversity is one of the key aspects in organization, one of the key issues that has emerged as a big concern in organization. So that's why we have given it in the module 2 itself and we have started the previous lecture, especially of the module 1, lecture 1, with introducing the concept of what the diversity would actually mean. Now here in lecture 2, we'll go a little bit deeper into understanding what diversity is, what do you mean by diverse workforce, what do you mean by inclusive mindset that is very much required in a diverse workforce. Welcome again to one and all, I'm Dr. Abraham Sirlaisek, Assistant Professor at the School of Business, Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. Now let's start with the quote again. Diversity does not necessarily imply true inclusion. Diversity does not necessarily imply true inclusion. Now, let's start with few questions that we can ask to ourselves as practitioners or as students of organizational behavior specifically. Take a moment to think of a workplace. It could be your workplace, it could be a friend's workplace, it could be the workplace of your near and dear ones which has a diverse group of people working. Now, when I'm talking about diversity, you have to understand and inculcate and try to bring in all the aspects of diversity which were discussed in the previous lecture. Do you feel that this is where the duty of organization stops, that just making the organization diverse, having people from different backgrounds, be it ethnicity, be it race, sex, caste, creed, anything, is that where the, the responsibility of the organization specifically stops? Or what would happen if there is no acceptance among different groups of people? What would happen if others are chastising or are not in favor of what all opinion or your own ideas, what you put forward towards the higher management? What should be the next step to ensure that the full potential of the workforce is utilized. So if you try to go through these questions and think about uh, these questions very specific to your organization or some organization which you have already worked for or which you know very closely, you will try to get to an answer or get to a position where you actually try to acknowledge and appreciate the relevance of diversity that exists in, in organization and the criticality of the same in every single organization. Now let's look into the types of diversity. When we talk about diversity, we have to understand that many a time it is not what you see in the periphery. So there are two types of diversity, one specifically is the surface level diversity. Now surface level diversity are observable attributes and characteristics of individuals that are readily apparent typically at the first glance. It could be anything from race, ethnicity, gender, age, physical abilities, language, religion, etc. Now interestingly these types of surface level diversity may not necessarily, may not necessarily reflect the deeper aspects of an individual's identity, experiences or perspectives. So for the sake of diversity you have in your workflows, workforce certain people who are from different uh, race, ethnicity, uh, uh, people with different physical abilities, cognitive abilities, people who come from different cultural backgrounds, different language etc. But it stops there. It does not essentially or does not necessarily reflect the deeper aspects of identity experience or specifically the perspectives you bring to the entire set of organization or your workspace. 
So this is specifically surface level diversity. Now if you look into deep level diversity, the second type of diversity which is more critical and which is more reliable in understanding diversity specifically, values, attitudes, experiences, skills, knowledge, personality, traits, cognitive styles, etc. So you are not going just through the periphery, you are actually digging deeper into it. You are looking into the different values that are enshrined in every, every single individual when he comes to the organization, the attitude he carries, the experiences and the skills which he possesses, maybe as part of his education or maybe as part of his experiences in previous organizations and the personality traits which are necessarily or which could be necessarily innate. I'm not again here venturing into the nature versus nurture debate, but there are certain ramifications of personality traits, cognitive styles, etc. in the deeper level diversity. So what exactly happens in the deeper level diversity? It is more significant and it has a greater individual interaction and collaboration within a group of organization or at least it is key. It is vital in understanding the behavioral response and the pattern of individuals within an organizational setup. So if you want to bring in or want to understand, comprehend what exactly diversity mean, you have to move away from surface level diversity and venture into what you understand as deep level diversity whereby these differences which are actually there, like what I've already mentioned in terms of values, attitudes, experiences, skills, knowledge, etc. These differences can actually influence the communication, the decision making, things like the conflict resolution and also it can bring in a overall decisive impact on the team dynamics. What the team constitutes what are the people up to, what is their predispositions in terms of the attitude, how do they behave towards a particular set of people, all these things are vital. We'll, we'll discuss this in the coming modules. But all these things are vital at this point I would like to mention when it comes to team dynamics and such a case, such a scenario is what defines diversity and such a scenario is what defines diversity with greater effectiveness. So deep level diversity is something which organizations nowadays are, are looking for, are working towards and with that I would also like to introduce or to give you a caveat that diversity is not all that a rosy thing that we see. Diversity could be a double-edged sword. Now, owing to both its advantages and disadvantages, some scholars specifically are of the view that diversity could cause some harm if it is not properly harnessed. Diversity could be a negative factor if it is not implemented rightly. Diversity could backfire if it is not properly understood and comprehended within the organizational knowledge. So let's look into the advantage. Advantage obviously we are looking into creativity. I will uh, in the coming slides I will look into things like neurodiversity etc where these points of creativity would be more clear, more, uh, more uh, specific there. Uh, there are, there are uh, people who can bring in lot of creative ideas, potentialities being realized to the, the upper extreme which brings in people to be very innovative and this is yet again an advantage of the diversity. Now we have people coming from different uh, backgrounds be it cultural, be it uh, in terms of their abilities, mental, physical etc. So they are, we are talking essentially of people bringing in different perspectives to a problem. Now different perspectives roughly translates to the way they look at the problem in different ways and the moment they start looking at different ways there is a significant possibility of emergence of good quality decisions and solutions. So obviously better decisions. And then we also have the opportunity of enhanced learning and growth because now it is not a, a forced, coercive, extrinsically motivated learning. You are in a team with a specific number of diverse people. So you tend to have a certain social learning. Thanks to Albert Bandura, that observation learning or social learning is also becoming vital when it comes to diversity. So this is where we have to understand that 
diversity has its own merits no doubt about it that said we cannot negate the fact that there are some pertinent disadvantages associated with diversity which include but are not limited to intergroup conflicts now in the moment we were very uh, very vociferous and very confident about the learning opportunities that diversity could bring within a group context but the corollary is that it can also bring in intergroup conflicts there could be people who do not accept or acknowledge the diversity in the first place there might be some superiority or inferiority complex working within the group scenario so it could organically bring in certain intergroup conflicts it could intentionally bring in some intergroup conflicts and especially when the resources are limited when the positions are uh, uh, few then there is always uh, an attempt to bypass others or to uh, outperform others or outweigh others when these types of uh, situations or activities happen it is quite natural that intergroup conflicts occur the second important disadvantage could be communication barriers when you talk about communication barriers you are looking at people who are coming from different cultural backgrounds different language they have different types of accents expressions the way they even carry out themselves the way even they have their uh, the demeanor the way they they present themselves are all different so in this situation in this context of the the commonality being the rarity and the commonality being relatively absent it is very difficult to understand another person's mindset so exclusion feeling is also a natural outcome a natural consequence of what uh, diversity is and ex and certainly it becomes a communication barrier now exclusion feeling by some groups as i have already uh, narrated it in the previous point there could be an idea that this particular person does not belong to our group or this a person does not belong to our sect or our our region our what all uh, you know aspects you can bring in think of so that specifically uh, nurtures a feeling of exclusion that us against them or me against you all these perspectives can bring in a uh, exclusion feeling now the yet again another disadvantage is more time to arrive at decisions you are looking at a more heterogeneous group you are looking at a group which will have let's say there are 10 people in that group there could be a possibility of 10 different opinion because you come from 10 different places you come from 10 different backgrounds you have 10 different uh, child rearing practices you had you had 10 different uh, context of upbringing you had 10 different types of exposure in terms of your education or your life otherwise so basically you are dealing with a set of heterogeneous people so that in itself would require would warrant more time to arrive at certain decisions whatever scientific tools you can use whatever technological advancement you can bring off one thing is for sure that you are dealing with a heterogeneous environment the decision making is not going to be that easy decision making is not going to be that conducive or it will be definitely time consuming now what do you exactly mean by inclusion let's look into inclusion from an aspect where you are trying to build an environment where all the individuals regardless of their diverse characteristics they feel that they are welcome respected valued and included as full and equal members so if you look into these these uh, these particular functional words the first and the foremost thing is bit lesser in terms of the grade or the degree you are looking into people welcome you, you know most of the times i don't think that there are scenarios you th think of yourself the first day you entered into your organization where you are thriving and flourishing and you are maybe the best employer that that the organization has seen in the recent past you would look into those situations where you have ventured into that organization in the first day you are definitely welcome you it's hardly there are any cases where the organization in itself would be antagonistic from day one the organization would definitely try to welcome you because you are the part of uh, the the workforce you are going to be the asset of the organization so it is natural that the organization will welcome you and 
The second part is little more tricky. The organization would respect you. There will be mutual respect. That has to be gained over a period in time. The value the, that the organization associates with you is mainly with respect to the value you can give to the organization. So over a period, you, you transform yourself within the organization to be the most valuable asset, to be the most contributing employee of the particular organization, then things are different. You are tend to be more valued and respected within the organization. And this will in turn give you a, a moment of uh, euphoria when you are actually from a different background. You are from a diverse background. You are from a different background from the rest of the lot, but still you are as good as any other member, full and equal membership or full and equal recognition in the organization. Now, this is vital. This is what exactly inclusion means. Now, inclusion should not be something that is happening at a peripheral level. Had it been happening at a peripheral level, you could have stopped at something as welcome or maybe at max respected. Once you are into the organization and you start getting respect, you start getting valued and you start getting included, as equal members, you are in the path of inclusion. Now, fostering a culture that encourages participation, collaboration, and a sense of belonging among all employees. Now, this is critical. If you are looking into organizations specifically, there are individuals who tend to contribute successfully. There are individuals who tend to contribute effectively. But many a time you feel that the organization has failed in creating a sense of belongingness. And this is vital for the success of any organization. Many a time if you people take the example of Toyota. Sometimes, uh, you know, uh, Honda or all these Japanese companies, they are known by the person who created by uh, created the, the particular vehicle or the car. So X, Y car or X car, right? Or ABC car. So they are, they are in itself, if you go to uh, the, the uh, local provinces of uh, Japan, you will, you will see that it is quite common to give them the credit what they actually deserve. So there is a sense of belongingness. Even it's a big multinational company. Even it's an organization that is spread across different countries within the globe you will still feel that every single employee in some organization working there specifically has that sense of belongingness. This sense of belongingness is vital, is a root for any inclusive measures or inclusive intervention. So if as, an, as a, as a uh, person who is part of a heterogeneous group coming from a diverse background in a diverse workforce, if there is no sense of belonging, it is very much possible that inclusion is not happening in a successful way. It ensures, means inclusion ensures that everyone's perspective and contributions are acknowledged and leveraged to achieve organizational goals. Organization in the end is looking at the bottom line or the top line. So specifically, once we, we spread our discussion in future modules to uh, the, the triple bottom line, etc., before that, if you look into organizations, organizational goals are vital. So if as an employee you are able to contribute towards organizational goal, you are a successful employee. This is what a simple definition of a successful employee is. In, in, in an inclusive environment, you can bring different perspectives. You can bring different solutions to complex problems. You can look into the complex problems from different angles and try to be as creative as possible. At the end of the day, if all this is not leading to organizational goals, it does not matter. So this is what inclusion is specifically. Now, I would like to take an example uh, and not to make this class monotonous from what I read in a HBR article. So Harvard Business Review, there was an article which explained why inclusive leaders are inclusive leaders are good for organizations. Now, inclusive leaders, that article specifically by Juliet Burke and Andrea Spadido, it mentioned that inclusive leaders are individuals who assure that all team members feel they are treated respectfully and fairly and are valued and sense that they belong and are confident 
and inspired. So there are a lot of factors in which I find it clearly relevant is that what I find clearly relevant is that the respectfulness and fair treatment is vital for inclusion. There could be situations where you are part of the workforce, you are priming with confidence, you are priming with your energy, you are priming with a lot of uh, uh, inputs that you can give future inputs that you can give to the organization. But if you are not treated respectfully, there is certain ridiculing that's happening. There are certain socially undesirable or counterproductive workforce behaviors that's happening in the organization. Could be social undermining, could be knowledge hiding, knowledge hoarding, whatever it is. If you are not treated respectfully and if you are not given a fair treatment in terms of your appraisal, in terms of your performance, you are tend to be uh, disappointed and you eventually will fade out in the organization. So what are the different steps that leaders could take or uh, what makes them more inclusive as given by these researchers? The first thing is visible commitment. Now there are people who say that uh, diversity is good but when it comes to the actual execution there are very few who actually challenge the status quo. They tend to challenge the status quo and establish the fact that yes, we are at this point and we would like to take our organization to this level from X to Y in terms of diversity. So there are very few people who actually tend to acknowledge and try to challenge the status quo if it is in a bad shape. This is the visible commitment that every good inclusive leader will have. The second important part is humility. Trying to accept the things as it is. Trying to understand that the organization might not be performing well in any of the scales of inclusion but there is a strong commitment so it's a strong resolve by the organization the top management to actually bring in more diverse workforce so this is yet again another important quality humility of leaders that that especially the inclusive leaders that they 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 show or they elicit the se the third most important thing is awareness of bias and we're looking into awareness of bias where they know that there are certain blind spots. There are certain blind spots organizations are having. Let's, let us acknowledge the fact that, okay, we tend to look into employee selection from a very biased angle. We tend to look only into the intellectual capacity. There are instances where you tend to look only at individuals from a particular place. There are instances where there are uh, where organizations look only into a specific gender. So let's understand that there are certain blind spots. There are certain bias. We are aware of that. Let's work above that. Let's rise above that and bring in more diverse workforce. The, th the fourth most important aspect is curiosity about others. If you are a person who is as a leader who is not aware and moreover curious about different different uh, the background of the particular individual it could be what they they eat what they dress or how do they talk or what could be the the initial attitudinal predispositions in which way they actually come to the organization the mindset they are ca carrying whether they are having a learning mindset a mastery mindset or it is more of a competitive mindset if you're not able to actually decipher, actually gauge that particular factor, then you are not to be uh, understood or recognized as a good inclusive leader. Good inclusive leader is always curious about others, the other features, the, the, the different cultural phenomena, different aspects. Similarly, finally, the cultural intelligence. Now, the cultural intelligence is significant because many a time people boast that they know about culture. But cultural intelligence is a step beyond that. Cultural intelligence is more about knowing the culture plus you also have to adapt yourself to the changing trends in that culture. For example, you might be aware of that in this cultural context, this is the way it, it has to be done. But you should also be very much aware of what your cultural context is, what your cultural predispositions are. Based on that, are you ready to adapt yourself? Are you try ready to mold yourself to be a better person in the context? 
with respect to the different cultural context this is what cultural intelligence is not mere understanding of the different culture not mere recognition or identification of culture but a step beyond a step beyond where you tend to understand and adapt towards other culture to bring in the good points or good uh, good aspects of other culture to your organization this is what cultural intelligence so researchers mainly claim that these are the mainly the different uh, key uh, aspects which make leaders more inclusive now let's look into neurodiversity neurodiversity is many a time misconstrued or less understood i repeat neurodiversity is many a time misconstrued or less understood let's understand the term neurodiversity first neurodiversity is not just knowing about neurodiversity it is celebrating the natural diversity of the neurological differences in human beings it is about acknowledging and celebrating the differences neurological differences now neurological variations can be many it can be something like autism it can be something like adhd attention deficit hyperactivity disorder it could be something like dyslexia or any other conditions which are simply part of the natural spectrum of human diversity now this is what human diversity the crux of human diversity is all about it challenges the idea that there is a normal or typical neurological profile sometimes it is understood that the challenges that there is as a normal person in a typical neurological profile is a myth you might not have the typical normalcy it might be gradations you might be with respect to some some actual diversity but might be existing even within us this very recognition this understanding would actually give you a better idea of what neurodiversity is so neurodiversity promotes the acceptance of neurological differences as a positive aspect of human variation rather than looking down rather than ridiculing on what neurodiversity is rather than mocking at neurodiversity because i would i would actually go through different uh, positive aspects in the next slide we as organizational psychologists we as students of organizational behavior should be able to appreciate acknowledge and celebrate the neurodiversity specifically now just like any form of neurodiversity employees with neurodivergence add to the organization in many ways it could be from something from taking diverse perspectives and problem solving diverse perspectives and problem solving you might you are looking at individuals with uh, uh, great perception you are in looking at individuals who are good in understanding patterns which otherwise normal people cannot you are uh looking at people who are more receptive to signals or stimuli which others generally tend to uh, see it as noise that you are looking at people who are who have greater attention to detail so all these are specific aspects that neurodiverse people can bring in to the table so these diverse perspectives can actually lead the organization to a very creative level of problem solving taking inclusion and equity forward now when you are looking into neurodiversity you are also trying to address and acknowledge the fact that you as an organization is more having equity you are walking the talk you are actually the organization who is diverse in its true sense you are taking the inclusion in the right way this is yet again another important aspect what neurodiversity can bring in there as i already mentioned neurodiverse people can actually look things in from a much cleaner and clear way they have greater attention to detail their recognition of patterns is something which is which is really impressive so you are actually the moment you are looking into uh, neurodiversity there is actual talent pool expansion this is what is critical now when you are having a sort of membership in within a team which is more homogeneous 
people will tend to think and perform in a similar way if let's say if it's your group let me take the example on myself it's a group with me as one of the member and relatively homogeneous in its structure then i'm pretty sure that every single other individual is going to think pretty much in the same way which i am going to think and the execution itself would be quite redundant because it is repetitive in nature but when you are looking into diversity, especially neurodiversity, you are having a situation, a scenario of improved team dynamics because you are getting different perspectives. You are getting higher problem solving skills. You are getting greater attention to detail. All these factors are embellished within your organizational setup. Now, there are certain legal and ethical considerations also you are checking off, you are signing off when you are actually going into neurodiversity. There are certain legal and ethical considerations that people from uh, you know different backgrounds are taken in so you are also making introduction to those world where organizations are generally shy in taking or accepting neurodiverse people then it also adds to the the reputation of the organization it gives or it it gives the organization a, a spirit of social responsibility that being as an organization it is doing what it is supposed to do. It is contributing to the society at large. It is contributing to the people who are from diverse backgrounds and it is also looking uh, good in terms of not only in paper but also in practice. So these are different factors whereby uh, or factors which actually give a great boost towards the organization especially when they accept, acknowledge and celebrate what neurodiversity is. Now before concluding, a small segment I'll try to improvise in our classes with understanding the diversity through data science at workplace. So many a times we tend to stop our diversity class in, in addressing the obvious. But let's look into the changing trends. What is happening now? In the world of data, in the world where data science and AI and ML are emerging, let's look into how diversity could be addressed with the help of technology in particular. Data science is an interdisciplinary field that combines techniques, processes, algorithms and systems to extract insights and knowledge from structured and unstructured data. So, Almost, I, I, I don't think that anybody who is, who is attending this lecture might be not aware of what data science is. But specifically, it, 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 it is a cursory part, cursory thing from my part to actually introduce you to what, what the subject is to, so that we can understand clearly what uh, benefit data science could bring in in addressing the diversity related issues. The first and the foremost one is understanding the demographic analysis. You are looking at people from different places, caste, creed, sex, race, etc. So it gives you an understanding of your organizational workforce, where exactly people come from. It The data driven methodology gives you an understanding of what your workforce certainly looks like. Is it biased or lopsided towards a certain sect of people? Is it too much inclusive or it is exclusive of some other sect of people? So these are certain aspects or parameters which data science can actually reveal. The second is data-driven hiring and recruitment. Data-driven recruitment will show you what your position is. At this point in time, as t is equal to zero, what is your workforce? What is the diversity inclusive or what is the diversity of your workforce? And how essentially you have to work to make your diversity to a certain level at t is t plus delta. So this is what the data-driven recruitment is all about. You tend to get a real-time picture of where you stand as an organization in terms of diversity right now and where to proceed from there. Retention and attribution analysis can also take the help of data and specifically when your turnover rates are very high, your attrition rates are very high. Data can actually help you in analyzing, understanding what is the underlying philosophy or what is the underlying reason why people are leaving the job. What is the underlying biasness, if any, that people are facing within the organization. Let's look into that. Let's try to address that so that the people who we have spent so much of time, labor, energy, money, in training and making ready the 
to work in this organization let them stay with us so this is yet again an important aspect in retention and attribution analysis employee survey and sentiment analysis even before the individuals leaving the organization let's take a step backward let's analyze at this point in time at 2023 month of this particular month what exactly is happening with the with the workforce are they upbeat are they disappointed are they not motivated so data can give you insights your machine learning algorithms can specifically give you some insights into where you are forecasting yourself after say a quarter after four quarters after two years after five years etc in terms of workforce there is also a, a possibility of performance and promotion analysis how people have worked over the years it could be more data driven rather than making subjective interpretations of the progress of individual across the organization it is more critical that you tend to bring in data try to understand what are the contributions to the organization by individual x in terms in tangible terms what is the contribution of y to the organization in tangible terms a certain level of comparison a comparative analysis with respect to all these employees would actually show you who is performing better in a more objective manner rather than bringing in your own biases as a manager rather than bringing in your own favoritism as a manager this would be a better better model to go ahead with there could be also issues or initiatives where you look into diversity and inclusion programs run and how they have benefited the organization are you doing it for the sake of checking a uh, ticking a check box are you doing it specifically to bring in more awareness and more knowledge into the workforce with respect to diversity and inclusion how has it benefited the organization data science and ml can definitely bring in a lot of insights in this particular aspect let's look into the predictive analysis part how forecasting can be done in terms of both the workforce as well as the revenue specifically with respect to a diverse workforce let's say you have more of uh, a people from particular country is it going to help you in terms of business at a particular level let us look into ceo being replaced and you are bringing a particular person from a particular country or ethnicity and placing in him or her, her there at the, at the helm so is it going to actually help the organization in it in its revenue generation as well as in business performance this is what the predictive analytics is all about this is what machine learning models can give you insights into this is what the data science can really help you to then finally recommendation for improvement whether the data science and data driven uh, activities can actually give you some insights into look this is what your organization has been doing for the past 5 years and we have not seen successful changes or we have not seen success across the last 5 years let's work a bit more this is the direction that data is suggesting let's go and do some training do some target oriented training let's do some uh, uh, situations or take up some uh, some uh, some aspects whereby you actually improve the workforce in a better way now finally when you are looking into individual level awareness using data science you have to also address the elephant in the room which is ethical data handling ethical data handling means are you looking into data which is personally identifiable information if you are looking into such pii's are you actually masking it anonymizing it these are very relevant pertinent questions when it comes to privacy protection are you giving the informed consent that your data as an employee will not be used in any other ways or any other means etc the moment if you fill any application specifically i have seen it in 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 us based organizations and companies they have diversity questionnaire in in particular and i feel that that is optional also so there they tend to take the data but they also give 
you an option of informed consent. So it is that you can actually make it as an optional and you need not fill the form. So basically the informed consent is also critical. There should be also aspects of bias detection and mitigation. If some machine learning models can actually look into as I have already mentioned, are there any particular blind spots that the organization as such or the managers in particular is having towards any particular sect of people? Are there any such biases existing? So bias awareness and bias mitigation again are vital in understanding what the organization is doing and where it is going ahead with the diversity. Are you going to do it in a, in a better way or are you not performing in the required uh, angle or in the required uh, intensity. Also we can look into transparency and explainability. Let's look into some machine learning models how they actually interpret the things and also look into those document processes whereby you can actually say that this is how the training has given or training has uh, a, a training has helped or aided the diversity inclusion within the organization. DI programs have been a success especially in the last quarter mainly because of this particular activity or this particular intervention mechanism whatever be the, uh, the, the situation be. So such things could have a greater or deeper insight especially in terms of transparency and explainability. Also there could be uh, such a data driven technology whereby the entire entire aspects that has been or entire uh, content of data that has been collected is totally communicated to you without any hindrance. So that gives you more transparency that gives you more confidence to work in such an environment. <coughs> There could be also engagement and communication where you effectively communicate to the stakeholders, whoever is present for the organization that look, this is the case, this many are the, this is the total workforce, this is a split up, this is the, the representation area wise, country wise, region wise, this is the representation in terms of qualification wise, this is the representation in terms of gender wise. So all these classifications will boost the reputation of the company, would enhance enhance the communication of the organization with the stakeholders. It could be anybody from the investor to the employee. It could be anybody from the person who is looking or taking or being a customer of that organization to a person who is actually opening the gates of that particular company. So this is something which is quite relevant in terms of engagement and communication. And finally, continuous learning and improvement. Kaizen is also critical when it comes to diversity. Most important important is stay updated. You are looking at a situation where you are adapting and adjusting to the changing trends. The adaptability is the key. You have to be the person who is more updated. What all are the different trends that are happening in, in MI models or uh, in terms of uh, the data science and machine learning models? What are the different trends that are uh, coming in or might come in the next 5 to 10 years? If those trends or those tools can actually capture where you are going with your diversity inclusion programs, where you are actually venturing into your uh, into in future with the diversity inclusion, then it would be it would make greater sense. So diversity by itself cannot ensure inclusion and equity. It is individual level belief, commitment, and awareness of inclusion is the way forward. So I would like to conclude by just giving you some insights into what we have discussed over this lecture. Diversity essentially does not mean inclusion. This is where we started and this is where we end. You might be an organization which will have diversity in paper and might be in practice also, but has that essentially translated into inclusion? Has it given you the spirit of inclusion, whether your team is more heterogeneous, whether your team is appreciating and celebrating the diversity, that's a totally different case. This is where you have to ponder as an individual working in organization, as a manager who has control and has certain uh, people working under you, as a CEO who is structuring the entire organization and has the entire organization working under you. It is relevant that your organization might be diverse. Your organization might have included a lot of people recently to make it more diverse, but it need not be essentially inclusive. Just one question, ask that whether 
inclusion is what you are looking for or is it mere diversity on that note we'll end today's session and we'll look more into this diversity aspects with the coming lectures till then take good care see you all bye